Okay, open your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. And we have been going through a, uh, a series called A Better Life. And uh, this is taking place in Psalm 1, all six verses. Uh, we've been through the first three verses, and this morning we're going to touch on the fourth. <clears throat> but let me say this about a better life. We all want it, I think. <laughs> we all want to have a better life. We all want to. Um, we all want our, our, our kids to have a better life than what, what we've had. And uh, I remember... <clears throat> I remember a story with, with my dad. We were, we were driving, and uh, my, uh, my stepbrother, Darren, was doing very well financially for himself. And, and uh, I, had, I had asked uh, Dad, I said, Dad, he's, he's got to be making, you know, you know, oodles of money right now. And he says, yeah, he's hundreds of thousands of year, my, my, uh, my stepbrother. And, and I said, well, Dad, I said, you always want your son to do better than you, right? And he says, yeah, but it's another thing for him to blow you out of the water. And, <laughs> and um, the reality is, is we do want, we do want uh, a better life for, for our relatives, for our friends, for our family. And, and uh, I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think that's necessarily covetous. I think that that's okay. You can want a better life for yourself. And, and when we examine Psalm 1, we find uh, really a, a recipe or a formula for what a better life looks like. Uh, we see in the first three verses, the first three verses, one to three, explains the godly man and how he, how he uh, uh, acquires the blessing, the blessed life, the better life. And in verses four to six, it explains the godless man and, uh, and what he has done to become godless. And I want to explain kind of these two distinctives because are two distinctives with a godless man. Uh, first of all, let me just remind you of the first three verses. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So we looked at those first uh, three verses, and we saw the first verse deals uh, primarily, I would say, primarily with a man who is departing. We call him the departing man. He's departing from uh, bad advice, a bad attitude, and bad actions. Verse 2 we get into that right here, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. We find that he is a delighter and a meditator, and primarily he is a deliberate delighter and a meaningful meditator. When we get to verse 3, we see this, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So we see a, uh, a disciplined man in verse 2, and in verse 3 we see a developing man. So a departing, a disciplined, and a developing man. Well, this morning we're going to look at a drifting man. A drifting man. And let's begin with verse 4. The ungodly, it says in verse 4 of Psalm 1, are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. There is a great uh, picture here when it comes to chaff blowing away in the wind as it's being winnowed. And what you have is you've got this scene of, uh, of, of grain being crushed down, and then uh, a shovel full of grain is, is cast into the air, and the wind comes and it drives away the chaff. That's the unwanted part. This is the picture you see here. The ungodly are not so. They're not prosperous like the godly. They are ungodly and are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind then driveth away. I want to say this, a few things really, about the ungodly person. This ungodly person can be one of two people. This ungodly person can be a person who is saved, who is a Christian, just acting like a non-Christian, so he's, uh, uh, he's saved, but uh, he's not serving. 
And this can also be an ungodly person, maybe a person who, who has never come to know the Lord and is always acting ungodly because they have no godly value because they are unsaved. So one of two things is the case here. But there is a stark contrast between verses 1 and 3 and verses 4 to 6. The difference here is those that have the blessings and those that have not the blessings. This is the haves and the have-nots, right? We've heard of these people, right? The primarily the haves are those people who, uh, who are prosperous and maybe who are wealthy, and the have-nots are the poor who don't have what the haves have, if that makes sense. Now, a blessed person can become unblessed. And I want to say this very clearly, that this person, this ungodly person, can vacillate between being blessed and being unblessed. If he is a saved individual and he is, he is uh, serving the Lord and he's having a right relationship with God, this person is going to have a blessed life. But the second the person begins to drift, they begin to remove themselves from the blessing of God. So we have to be careful of this. Uh, primarily, when I look at these, this verse, verse 4, the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. This person is, um, is, is, has deviated from orthodoxy. Uh, that is our thinking, our belief, is being straight. So orthodoxy is straight thinking. And so this person here has deviated from straight thinking, which then results uh, in a, a problem with what we call orthopraxy, which is the practice of what it is we believe. So you have orthodoxy, which is straight thinking, and then orthopraxy, which is straight behaving. Okay? So this person has uh, deviated. And I've said failed orthodoxy leads to failed orthopraxy. And if we fail in the way we believe, we will fail in the way we behave. So we have to start with right thinking, and this is the premise of our addiction program. We talk about our addiction program and what we do in our addiction program. We say that we're not here to change how a person behaves, but to change how they believe. If we get a guy thinking right, he'll act right. So this person, in verse 4, has begun to drift Number one, from the word. He drifts from the word. And when it comes to a better life, we must understand that a right relationship will always lead to a right reward. But when you begin to drift away from the word of God, you will end up not just diminishing orthodoxy, but orthopraxy. So we don't want to slip and we don't want to drift. This is the drifting man. A great verse, I, I just love using this verse because it says so much, is Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. A more earnest heed simply means a more frequent application. It means a more frequent application. And the word slip is a nautical term which is used to describe a drift. So therefore, if we don't more frequently apply the things we've heard, we'll drift away from them. If we step away for just a moment and just, exa just, 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 just imagine a, a boat. Now, we've all been on a boat where it's drifted, I think. At least if, if uh, I grew up in Minnesota, a land of 10,000 lakes, and, and, uh, and we, we've been anchored numerous times, and, and you go back and you find that you've actually drifted from the point that you thought you were. And... Uh, and you can see that illustrated here. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed, the more frequent application to the things we have heard, lest at any time we drift away from them. And drifting is a very serious problem. If you ask a sailor, what is one of the greatest problems that you have when you're anchored, he'll say that what ends up happening is we begin to drift away from where we thought we were anchored to. And then you end up in a place that you don't want to be. And let me give you a little application that a better life is a life where a person is cautious of the drift. Be cautious of the drift. Did you know that a giant drift doesn't happen in a second? It takes time. 
It takes time for you to drift away from the things which you once knew to be true. One man said this. Uh, he said, the man who removes a mountain begins by carrying away small stones. And this is how it is with a Christian. We keep carrying away these little itty bitty stones and we don't realize that we have drifted, we have drifted from where we were anchored. At one point in time, we would say that we were anchored and we, we knew the word of God, but we drift away from the word of God one small stone at a time. And this just doesn't happen overnight. It happens a little bit at a time and a little bit at a time. Before long, you realize that look where I've gotten. I'm all the way over here and I should be all the way over there. So if I can encourage you this morning as we talk about drifting from the word, check your anchor. Know where you're anchored. From time to time, get out on the deck and pull on that anchor and say, have I drifted from the word? Am I getting away from the word of God? This is the anchor that we have. I, I, I said before that I love memorizing because it doesn't change. It, it doesn't change. You, you can look through, look, look through history books and you'll find just a, a variety of things. And, and well, this happened on this date to this one guy and this guy was the conqueror. And, and then you look at another book and, and this happened on this date and, and this was the conqueror. And you say, well, which one is right? And when we begin to drift away from the word of God, we'll have no sure foundation so we have to, from time to time, check our anchor. Can I say this, that the drifting for all of us has already begun. The drifting for us, all of us, has already begun. In, in Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you look at yourself as a, as a sheep that has, that has uh, begun to stray? Because we've all gone astray. And we are in the process of continually going astray. Now I want to say this, that none of us are exempt from the danger of the drift. None of us are exempt from the danger. But those in the biggest danger are the doubting drifters. They're the ones that say that I will not drift. They're the ones that don't get on the boat and don't check their anchor a little bit from time to time. It's the ones that say, that couldn't happen to me. Now, when I look back and, and, and I see, uh, I see a, a, a church, I see a Bible college, I see, I see my heritage, I look backward and I say, the people that scare me the most are the ones that say, I'm a doubting drifter. That I couldn't be like that. Those people scare me the most. You know who gives me the most assurance are those that say, I could be just like that guy. And by the grace of God, I'm not. But who get up on top of that deck and grab their anchor and give it a good tug and say, I'm still latched into the ground. I still have a sure foundation. But not someone that goes back and doesn't ever check it again, but it's the person that comes back up and says, but I'm going to check it again. People are drifting from the Word. Now this isn't new. And, and it's not old. The drifting will continue. Not only is the drifting uh, for us already begun, but the drifting will continue. We see that in 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And I believe, I believe with all my ransom soul that we are in the last times, and we've been saying that forever, but I have to tell you this, that we have to be closer to the end than we are at the beginning. Amen. We've got to be closer to the end. You just look around and this right here is saying exactly where we are at. Men, women, we are departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. People are departing across the board. You see, you see unsaved people who don't want anything to do with God, and then you find saved people who are walking away. Now, they're not going to lose their salvation. They might lose a reward. 
They're not going to lose their salvation, but you see them drifting, and primarily they're drifting from the Word. If the Word has life, we've drifted from it. We need to get on top of our boat and we need to check our anchor. And we have to be careful and cautious of the drift. And don't be a doubting drifter. Don't be one that says, this cannot happen to me. I grew up in the church. I've memorized my Bible. I was in Awana. I did all of the right things. And the person who drifts says, so did I. But I got away from the boat too long. And I didn't check my anchor. So check your anchor. So there's a drifting from the word. And number two, there's a drifting toward the world. There's a drifting toward the world. Um, this is a tough thing. And when we are drifting away from something, we are simultaneously drifting towards something. So when we are drifting away from the word, we're, we're simultaneously drifting towards the world. And we have to be careful of this. Uh, and I think the Bible is clear on the reason for this. Why do we drift away from the word and to the world? And I think it's found here in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, where it says this, Take heed, we see that again, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We're departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, why it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We, we veer from the word into the world because of unbelief. Well, of course your belief isn't going to be strengthened by the word if you've drifted from it. It's just going to get worse. And when a Christian isn't checking their anchor, often enough, there is no accountability. There's no accountability. So guess what happens? We drift towards the world. One guy said this. He said that uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And I put on your sheet here that a step in the wrong direction will lead you a thousand miles from where you ought to be. But in reality, it's 2,000 miles from where you thought you'd be. Because you thought you were going to be a thousand miles in that direction. And that's true if you take a step this way. And if I take a thousand steps in this direction, I'm going to be from point A to point B twice as far from where I thought I would. We have to be careful of this. Now, there are two reasons why I put down, or I put down here, two, two main reasons why I think that we drift into the world. Two main reasons. Number one is ignorance of the world's danger. Ignorance of the world's danger. Uh, when, I was a, when I was a kid, uh, we used to have these little stickers. They look like this. You ever see these little stickers? The poison help. They were the, I think they were the Mr. Yuck, right? Is that what they are? Yeah. And uh, they used, my, my mom would take these little stickers and they would, they would put them <clears throat> on, on bottles of, uh, of chemicals that if you ingested, you were certainly going to die. Matter of fact, last night I sent this image to my wife and she responded with, you know, basically, are, she called me, she says, are you hurt? I'm like, no, I'm not hurt. I said, what, what makes you think I'm hurt? She says, well, you sent me this image. And she says, I thought maybe that there was something wrong. And, and uh, so I got home, and she was talking to her, her, uh, her sister-in-law, Jen, and, and she says, yeah, you sent me this image. And I said, honey, let me just stop you right there. If I am sick because I drank some poison, I'm going to call 911, not look, the inter look up the Internet for Mr. Yuck sticker. <laughs> and, uh, but anyways, my mom would take these little Mr. Yuck stickers, and she'd put them all over intentionally to, to warn me of danger. This was a, a caution symbol. This was telling me that if this is consumed, there is a problem, right? Uh, this is the little green sticker. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, it says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding darkened. Pay close attention to this. 
being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Now, I think that one of the reasons why we, why we drift toward the world is there is an ignorance of the danger. There's an ignorance of the danger. We don't, uh, we don't suppose that, this is, uh, that it's dangerous out there. And, uh, and not only is there an ignorance of, of the danger, the, the, the world does a great job at making danger look exciting. It's like jumping out of an airplane. How many of you jumped out of an airplane? Brooks? Did you land and jump out of an airplane? You have jumped out? You got in? Okay, I'm going to just check this off my list of crazy people in the church. I know that Brooks did. I didn't think, uh, I didn't think he did. I thought you said you always wanted to. No, that's why he married her. It was danger going into it. Anyway, uh, the world makes a, 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 it look really good, doesn't it? Makes it look flashy. And not only are they, uh, not only is there not the intentional sticker that <laughs> signifies danger, but I think they intentionally remove it. They intentionally remove the sticker so it doesn't look dangerous. So I think that one reason is that they're ignorant of the world's danger. I think that's why we drift away into or toward the world is we're ignorant of uh, the danger. Number two, I think there's an attraction to the world's dazzle. That is to say that it makes it look really good right now, doesn't it? Doesn't the world make, uh, make it look really good right now? Like, I want tangible right now. As uh, Howard and I were talking on Friday, and we were talking a little bit about uh, how a person has no self-control to be able to say no anymore. And uh, they don't have a, a, a rational type thinking. And, and uh, uh, we talked about even investing. And investing takes a, a long-term goal. It takes a lot of denial right now. And, uh, and he used an illustration. He said, if I was to give you $10,000 right now or give you a penny compounded every day for 30 days, which one would you take? And the vast majority of people would say, I'll take the 10000 right now. But what they don't realize is that if we deny ourselves and say, no, I'm going to wait for a penny compounded every day, that, that, that in, in about 22 days, you're at 5 million, and, uh, and at 30 days, I mean, you're just, it's, it's a tremendous amount of money. And so the world does a great job at saying, hey, look what 10,000 can get you right now. Look at the money you can have right now. And it's a trap for us. It's a trap for us. The world makes 10,000 right now look better than untold riches in eternity. And how can we deny ourselves that? We want it right now. So I think there's an attraction to the world's dazzle. There's so much out there for us that we want it and we want it right now. And the Bible is clear. It says in Mark 8.36, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We have to be thinking about this. Now, I, let me say, I, I believe that the reason why we go towards the world is because we have gone away from the word. We have no benchmark. We have no litmus test. There is nothing that says, no, that's wrong, and you shouldn't go towards the world. It's, it's, uh, we're ignorant of the danger. We're, 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 uh, we, we like the dazzle. It's like, yes, we want this, but it's all because we've drifted away from the word. And nobody wants to drift Nobody wants to drift, and nobody drifts intentionally. It happens a little bit at a time, and a little bit at a time, and a little bit at a time, and before long you realize how far you've come, but not in the right direction. Not in the right direction. We've wanted the gain of this world because we don't want the glory of the word. If we gain the whole world and don't have a relationship with God, the Bible says we have nothing. But it seems so far out there. Eternity is, is so far out there. How do we get there? Well, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. But we have to step in the right direction and we have to have a 
a map, a road map, so to speak, and how to get there. And that's the Word of God. The Word of God is what's telling us which direction to go. This is our map. And when we drift away slowly, a little bit at a time, well, well, we don't do this one thing, and maybe we don't do this one thing, and maybe there's this, this, other little, this other little thing that we don't really do. When we haven't gotten on the ship and actually tugged on that anchor, we're going to realize real quick that, look how far I've come. And those are the people who are the doubting drifters who says, it could never happen to me. Well, you see, I don't, I don't do that. I don't murder anybody. I don't do that one thing. I mean, I, I haven't hurt anybody. We say, well, that could have never happened. But you know what? I'm scared of that. I'm scared of that for me. Because I could be just like that. We need to be careful of it. We need to be careful of it. The world may dazzle the eye, but it can also lead to a dangerous drift. So we have to be careful. We have to be anchored. We have to know the anchor, which is Christ. Let me ask you this this morning. Do you know where you're anchored? Are you sure that when you die, you're going to heaven? Are you sure that when you die, are you going to heaven? Is that, is that your destination? Are you setting your affections that direction? Is your step is your step in the right direction? Is that going toward that, that goal, so to speak? Not that a person works their way to heaven, but, but they're setting their affections on heavenly things. Are you checking your anchor? Are you knowing for sure these things? I want to share with you an illustration I'm sure you've never seen before. It involves a wallet. And... Uh, when I came to know this illustration, I said, now that's a great illustration. That's a great example of knowing for sure where you're going when you die. I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that God loves us, hates our sin. Now there's a lot of people that says, well, well, I, I, am, I am in the Word, and I'm out of the world, so I must be going to heaven, but the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it says that the wages of sin is death. So the question is, is has there been death for this sin? See, going to heaven isn't about you getting into the Word and out of the world. It's about understanding that Jesus Christ made the payment for you. I want this hand right here to represent the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, right? And then it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. You see, the Bible is clear. It's not about turning over a new leaf or walking an aisle or giving money to the church or getting baptized. The Bible says that God loves us, hates our sin, but this sin requires death. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to die for that sin. Well, that's not how you build a big church. That's not how you build a big local assembly, by telling everybody they don't have to do anything. I mean, don't you think it'd be better for me to say, hey, listen, in order to go to heaven, you've got to come to church. You got, in order to go to heaven, you've got to give your money, you know? In order to go to heaven, you've got, you got to be good people. Well, I have a lot of good people, but I have a lot of unsaved people. I would have a lot of people who are working their way to hell, and that's the truth of it. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Salvation is a gift. It's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. The Bible says it's faith that is counted for righteousness. Not money, not walking an aisle, or getting baptized, or praying a prayer. It's when you place your faith alone in Christ alone as your Savior. It's not about your works. It's about his works. It's about what God has done for us, not what we can do for Him. How would we ever know if we were actually saved if it was about our works? How would we actually know if we are going to heaven, have I done enough good works? I was baptized. Was it, was, was it at the right time? Was it enough water? Was the water at the right temperature? Was I held under long enough? Was I, not, was I held under too long? I mean, did I give enough money? How much is enough money? Should I give more money? 
I mean, just all these questions, right? And so the Bible is very simple. It's when we place our faith, right? The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for that sin. And 2,000 years ago, He died on the cross to pay for your sin. And in exchange, He would give you eternal life when you believe in Him. That salvation just so awesome. And then He secures us and he, he keeps us saved forever. Because if we could lose our salvation, then it wouldn't be based on His death because He died once for all. Then it would be based on, did we do enough good works? Did we walk enough while? Did we pray enough? Did we give enough? Did we get baptized enough? But we are kept saved by His power. And so I don't go home at night thinking, I wonder if I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. It's so refreshing. Isn't it? Friends, if you haven't done that today, I encourage you to do that this morning. To trust in Christ as your personal Savior. To believe that He died for your sin. That He was buried and rose again the third day. And friends, if you do that, you'll be saved forever. And that is a miracle.